Uh, in this video clip, we are going to talk about the uh, organization logic for ownership. Or more broadly, we can uh, think this as uh, a discussion about uh, property, uh, intellectual property, and pap and patent. The uh, the idea is that uh, the organization needs to do some invention, and uh, the organization needs to hire some uh, entrepreneur to do the invention. So now the question is whether or not we should allow the entrepreneur to develop on its own or whether or not uh, the organization should uh, pay for the uh, development uh, itself and uh, on the, on the uh, property. And we're going to discuss this uh, problem from two sides. One is ex ante, uh, one is ex post. And we would, at the preview of the result, we would see that uh, there is no single clear solution to the problem, and one has to weigh the benefit and uh, cost of uh, private ownership. Okay, so let's start with X and T. So the setup, so the setup is like this: uh, an entrepreneur, or let's say here the agent, can invent. Uh, uh, something, some ma magical uh, stuff, and uh, he has a cost of negative one half a square. And uh, after he pay the cost, uh, the invention will value a to the firm. Okay, so just from the get go, we can uh, know we know that the socially optimal level of invention is when a equals to one, is when the social surplus uh, is maximized is uh, maximized. So now the, 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 game, the sequence of the game is like this. So first, the uh, agent uh, makes the effort to invent the magic stuff. Then the firm uh, gave the worker a ticket or leave it offer. And uh, then the game uh, concludes. If uh, no agreement is reached, uh, everybody gets zero. Now, so let first uh, let's think of, for a minute uh, what kind of offer the firm will make at the very end. So it sh should not be coming a surprise to you that the firm will charge exactly, uh, or will, will pay the agent exactly at the outside option. So that means uh, the firm will be uh, make the agent indifferent between uh, taking the offer and or work away, and the firm will be able to pocket the rest of the uh, re residual value or rent in economic jargon. So, what is outside option uh, uh, depends on what is the uh, ownership structure. If the agent is work for hire, that means he cannot resell. That means uh, his outside option value of outside option is zero because I cannot resell. So the firm will make uh, the, uh, the worker offer that is zero. And the worker knows that, so his utility is he gets zero, but he has to pay well half uh, a square. So he will choose optimal uh, effort of zero. If uh, the worker is uh, developed on its own, and uh, got the uh, intellectual property, his uh, outside option value will be just what is the resale value, which is lambda a. And it is easy to set up the maximization game, uh, the formula, and get equals to lambda. Uh, so now, and let's assume, further assume, that lambda is. Between zero and one. The reason is that let's say uh, the firm. Uh, the now let's say because uh, there is some complementary between the firm and the agent. So uh, the agent uh, designed the uh, the devices for the firm, and if the firm not using it, someone else uh, using it will not be able to fulfill its full potential. So now we can clearly see from this example that the work for hire uh, 
uh, the uh, the effort level of effort for the worker uh, for work for hire is smaller than the amount of effort spent by a private development uh, agent and is less than the social optimal. Uh, the reason we have this is purely because uh, the agent can uh, for can tell that the firm will give him a, a ticket or leave it offer exactly priced at his offset option, and uh, rather than pay what he should pay, which is A, uh, for his, his trouble. And the difference between the uh, basically the forced uh, offset option and the optimal uh, value A is what we call hold up problem. So the firm uh, can hold up the agent uh, after the uh, invention is done. And uh, because of that, the agent uh, was not willing to uh, invest optimal amount of effort. So in this case, clearly that privatization, or let's say let the agent on the uh, intellectual property is superior. But uh, we can see from the real world that uh, not everyone uh, not every firm allowed the agent to own intellectual property. And uh, it's especially when we look at the world, we can see all kinds of patent war and a patent troll, which is very troublesome. So that must mean there's something wrong with the uh, private ownership of the patent. And now we are uh, trying to uh, get a, a crack at this problem. So now let's set an exposed problem. So now setup is, uh, you can think of a world where the magic device has already been invented, and the firm has actually two agents. Uh, the agent one values the device quite highly, so 20% of the chance that he will value it to be one, and 80% uh, of chance that it will be valued to be uh, uh, three. And the agent two uh, value 20% uh, the chance that it will value at two, an 80% chance that Agent 2 thinks uh, the device is just a piece of junk. Uh, unfortunately, right now, Agent 2 has a device. So he is ha currently has the device. If the company, so let's say first scenario is the company it has a property right. So when a firm has property rights, uh, uh, it can easily uh, just look at the valuation of agent one, agent two, and uh, figure out whether or not it is uh, uh, valuable to make the trade or not. Uh, for example, if the agent, if V1 is three, and V2 is uh, either uh, zero or two, it didn't matter, then the trade should happen. If V1 is equal to one, and V2 is equal to zero. The trade also should happen. If V1 equal to uh, one, and V2 equal to zero, then the trade should not happen. And it is just as simple as that. There will be no uh, bargaining problem uh, involved in this stage. So uh, now, let so which is quite efficient. Now let's look at the second part where. Uh, the agent two actually has a property rights. So now when agent two has a property rights, uh, it, we need to resort the firm only can broker a deal when both sides agree on a price uh, and is transfer between uh, agent uh, one and agent two. So now we're going to go through some lengthy discussion, uh, try to prove that no price will do, do a trick. Or, or should I say no fixed price will do a trick. So let's uh, again consider four scenarios. Now the first scenario says that if uh, P, uh, agent one values the device at price uh, at one, and if agent two uh, value the price at zero, so now the price, if we make the make a trade happen, the price has to be smaller than one, right? Otherwise, agent there will be he won't pay. Now in the second case that uh, agent two. Uh, value that two and agent one value three. The agent two won't accept any price that is uh, smaller than one. So the price has to be larger than one. And if you take the intersection of these two, already we show that there is no fixed price. 
no one price that it will uh, clear all the markets. Okay, so that is just not going to be cut it. And we're assuming that both agent one and agent no, uh, agent two does not know uh, what is actual value uh, of the what is actual valuation of the uh, opponent of the device. Uh, now, further, let's consider another two uh, scenario. If uh, V equals to one, uh, if agent one value at one and agent two value two. Uh, there is simply not going to be any trade because there is no uh, surplus to be had. The tricky situation is here when uh, agent one is uh, valued at three and agent two is valued at zero. So uh, there will be a price that has to uh, make it uh, incentive compatible for the agent two to reveal that it actually uh, is value zero rather than uh, fake that it is value two. So now, when agent zero fake, uh, agent two fake that it has a value two, uh, there is a probability uh, point eight that he will be able to sell it by price two, uh, because the agent one actually will value at three and willing to pay a price of two. But there will be probability uh, twenty percent that it will get nothing. Uh, on the other hand. If uh, he actually says uh, price uh, p, uh, there will be twenty percent of the chance that the agent one will actually pay him one dollar, uh, and there's eighty percent of a chance that he will actually get away with p. So uh, this is the uh, uh, incentive compatibility uh, constraint for agent to report truthfully report p. A uh, truthful report that he has a valuation zero rather than that he has a valuation two. When he has a valuation zero, uh, the company uh, will be able. Uh, so the so this is a compatible uh, incentive compatibility constraint for the uh, agent two to report that he actually has a valuation uh, zero when the company actually sets the price to be p. And now that works out to be. P has to be larger than 1.75. Uh, similarly, we have to work out the uh, this is for agent two. We have to work out the incentive compatibility for agent one as well. So for agent one, if he lies that uh, he actually has a valuation one, uh, eighty percent of the chance. Okay, he can get away with surplus two because his actual valuation is three, and twenty percent of the chance that he actually uh, gets nothing. Now, it should has to be uh, incentive compatible for the agent to report that he actually valued three. So there will be twenty percent of the chance that the agent one will be charged at a price two because agent two value it at a price two. And 80% of the chance that he will be aw get away with three minus p, and that value works out to be p is smaller than 1.25. So that means uh, for agent two to tell the truth, the price has to be larger than 1.75. For agent one to tell the truth, the price has to be smaller than 1.25. So there is no price that satisfy. Uh, this uh, incentive compatibility constraint, so that both agents will be truthful in reporting that type. So there will be no price work out here either. Uh, so here, now we get into a problem where uh, if we, the firm, actually uh, has a work for hire uh, scheme, it has the property rights, and it will be able to broke a lot of profitable trade. Well, if the agent actually get a hold of the uh, patent. They will try to extract as much rent from the other side as possible. Actually, no trade would happen, even if uh, the doing so will actually enhance the uh, total welfare of the firm. You can think uh, of a patent war between Apple and Google, when actually uh, it will be better for both of them. To trade some of the patents so that nobody gets sued and uh, the consumer can be happy. So, in short, uh, we face a trade-off between uh, work for hire and proper uh, private development. Uh, 
in the ex ante, uh, private development gives the agent uh, more incentive uh, to exert uh, efficient effort. But uh, in the ex post, private development uh, poses a very high barrier for efficient parking. Uh, and that makes it hard for the agent to cooperate. So the firm has to be, when decided whether or not, when it decides ownership, it has to take this two uh, parts into consideration.